Good morning, and welcome to another highlight event of the 2018 Colonials Weekend, a conversation with the President. Would you now welcome to our stage the President of the GW Student Association, Ashley Lee, and the President of the George Washington University, Dr. Thomas LeBlanc. Looking forward to it. Thank you, too. All right, good morning, and thank you for being here with us today at one of the highlight events. My name is Ashley. I am the president of the Student Association. I have the honor of talking to President LeBlanc today. Um, let's have a seat. Before we begin, um, I just also want to say welcome to our online um, audience as this event is also being live streamed. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about, with President LeBlanc about a few things that he is doing, um, and we will also be answering some questions that have been submitted over the past few weeks by alumni, students, and staff. So, President LeBlanc, how are you doing today? How is the weekend going? So let me say I feel very uh, intimidated that I'm being interviewed by the President of the Student Association. <laughs> uh, I've had a chance to get to know Ashley working together. I first met her, Ashley is a very high quality photographer. And so all of last year, she was taking my picture. And then she got elected president of the Student Association, and showed up, and I said, where's your camera? <laughs> well, Mr. President, I'm the new president of the Student Association. It's great working with you. It's great to be here with you this morning. It's been great. And I will still taking pictures of you. If, Thank you. If that's OK. <laughs> Maybe selfie from now on. But <laughs> Yeah. Um, so we, in our jobs, we talk a lot about um, your initiatives, and especially about the student experience, about my experience, about my friends' experience. So do you want to talk a little bit, share with everyone here about um, just where you are with it, or maybe give everyone a couple updates on how things are going? I'd love to. First of all, we're a university. Uh, we create knowledge and we disseminate knowledge, and we disseminate knowledge to our students. So making sure the students are having a first-rate experience is one of the key parts of our mission. The challenge is that most of us aren't students. Uh, the president isn't a student. I was, but I'm not now. So although I live on campus, I don't live in the residence halls. I don't eat in exactly the same places the students do. I don't take classes. I don't try to juggle my internship with my on-campus activities. So it's really only the students who know what it's like to be a student. So I've tried to spend a lot of time listening to them and hearing about ways in which we could proactively improve their experience. Uh, this encompasses all aspects of the experience whether it's inside the classroom, outside the classroom, everything about being a student here from the moment they go through the admissions process to graduation and beyond with, with career placement. So we've been looking at every aspect of that and frankly, a great resource has been the students, including the student association and their leadership. Uh, I'll give you just one very recent example. Uh, through our conversations, I became aware of the fact that students really wanted to be able to take 18 credit hours a semester in some circumstances. And under our current policies, a full tuition bill only covered up to 17 credit hours. Now, most students actually take 15. They take five courses, three credits each. But students in science and engineering have lab courses that are four courses. Studio arts might have more credits. So there are a variety of reasons why a student might want to take 18 credit hours. So we talked about it uh, with uh, the previous govern uh, government leadership in the, in the Student Association. Uh, we studied it at the administrative level, and I was very pleased uh, when our Board of Trustees approved the new policies and effective, I think, fall of 2019, uh, full tuition will cover 18 credit hours. And I think this is a classic example of how we work together for me to understand the problem, to work with my leadership team to solve the problem, present it to the trustees, and approve it. It's just one simple example of a barrier that existed that prevented students from achieving their academic goals. There are other barriers. Um, one of the other things I'm particularly uh, uh, happy about is the faculty of the, of the Elliott School have voted to approve the creation of a Bachelor of Science degree within the Elliott School. Now, 20% of our students are in the Elliott School, and up until now, they could only do a Bachelor of Arts. And what that meant was if they wanted to do a second major in a STEM discipline, it was almost impossible. But with the introduction of a Bachelor of Science degree, they'll not only become experts in international relations, they'll have the opportunity to also study public health, computer science, data analytics, a field that would contribute to their career goals. So those are examples of things on the academic side. On the, on the 
Outside the classroom side, we've looked very carefully at things like our meal plan and how students interact over food and are students able to eat both, both healthy and enough. So we made major changes to our meal plan. Again, in consultation with the leadership of the Student Association and hearing from students. We're working on a project to do major renovations of some of the residence halls, starting with Thurston. Uh, I always call Thurston, uh, it's just like the Army. <laughs> Nobody wants to do it, but after you've done it, you want to make sure everybody else does it. Uh, and, and there's a limit to that argument, and I think it's time for us to do a very significant renovation of Thurston. We're planning to do that. Uh, we hope to kick that, off, that project off formally soon. So eating, living, academics, all aspects of the student experience is what we're working on. That's wonderful. Um, I remember a couple weeks ago, we had our freshman day of service and convocation, and um, begin, we began serving the community. You talked to the students a little bit. Um, you were giving them a little bit of advice about social media and use. So I was wondering if you would be able to share that today, um, maybe with the parents and students who weren't there that day. So whenever I get a chance to address students, I like to try and take some of this wisdom I've acquired over my long career in higher ed and share it with them. Uh, I'm the parent of, of two sons. Sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. I give it a shot. Uh, so I had all of the freshmen at freshman convocation, and I asked myself, what one or two pieces of advice do I want to give all the incoming freshmen? So the first was about social media. And I'm sure all the parents in the room already instinctively get this. Uh, but it's important to understand, and I'm a computer scientist. I've been dealing with this technology in the laboratory long before everybody had it in their hand. Uh, I remember the early days of the internet. So most of the things that America is now experiencing, I've seen in some guys 20, 30 years ago. And I just wanted to share with the students the fact that social media lives forever. Um, very, very few things on social media are worth remembering, but nothing is forgotten. And I want our students to understand that. Uh, we, we need to understand that the students coming in as freshmen today have spent their entire teenage years with a cell phone in their hands. The first generation of iPhone is a little more than 10 years old. So every one of them coming in today has probably had a cell phone since age eight. And we're now seeing students apologizing for postings they made at age 12. Think about that. How many of you want to apologize for everything you did when you were 12? So what I want our students to understand is this concept of a community bubble at college where you can debate anything and say anything and learn and make mistakes and build community, this concept is now surrounded by social media. And this idea that I can say something stupid in a classroom and people can call me out for it and I can learn from it and then we walk away and like Las Vegas, it's been left behind, that may not exist anymore. And so I just want students to think very carefully about curating their intellectual pursuits as much as they're curating their social media personality. I understand the importance of social media to this generation. I'm not telling anybody what to do with social media. I'm just giving them a piece of advice. I hope you'll think very carefully about how you curate your personality on social media because it will live forever and it does not remain in the kind of bubble that historically uh, the debates in colleges uh, remained within. The other piece of advice that I gave the students, again, came from feedback from our students uh, themselves. And that is a huge value of coming to college at GW is that we're sitting in Foggy Bottom. We call the District of Columbia the most consequential 64 square miles in the world. And our students use this location as a living learning laboratory. And so a lot of them come to DC and to GW in significant part because of the opportunities that come from that, and primarily through internships. And I think internships are fabulous. We have a lot of infrastructure support to help students get internships, to use those internships as training ground for future careers. I've got nothing negative I want to say about internships. But you can have too much of a good thing no matter what that good thing is. And when I arrived at GW and we kept talking about internships and I kept thinking how wonderful all this is, as a computer scientist, it never occurred to me that internships meant every single week of every single semester. Computer scientists generally don't do internships as freshmen because they don't know anything. What computer company is going to hire somebody who doesn't know anything about the thing they do? 
But in our case, I had students coming up to me and saying, I'm really concerned. It's the second week of my freshman year, and I don't have an internship yet. And I said, why are you worrying about an internship? You've got classes to take, friends to meet, a city to discover, a university to explore. Well, because I'm behind. Some of my friends have internships. So the other piece of advice I gave to the students was, you have tremendous resources at this university. I hope you use your first year to build a strong platform for taking advantage of all the resources in the district by using the resources of the university first. And then on that strong platform, you'll be better prepared to take advantage of, of the many internships that are out there. So those were the two pieces of advice I tried to give. I'll keep talking about it over the year, and, and we'll see uh, if students start to take some of that advice, or at least we'll get a conversation going where they'll say, maybe you missed this point, and, and I'll change my mind a little bit. So we'll see. That was my, that was my attempt at convocation. <laughs> Right, and I can speak for myself, as a student in the School of Media and Public Affairs, internship play an important role, but only when I start getting the skills, and only when I have already made a lot of connection with the alumni, um, the faculty, and the professors in the university. And I think that, that part about building community within where we are um, actually can help us getting better, especially at internship, rather than coming in my first year and looking for an internship my first week of the freshman year. Um, so yeah. So maybe you and I can go on the road together. <laughs> I still have school. I like this, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, now I want to turn uh, to questions that we have received from our community. Um, we have selected these questions from alumni and staff and students, um, and we receive a very wide range of um, topics. So the first question that we have is from an alumnus. Um, could you explain the current status of alumni relations and how alumni affairs could be structured moving forward? So this is a detail about the university that a lot of people may not be familiar with, but we have historically uh, had an organization called the GW Alumni Association, GWAA, that is actually a separate entity from the university. It's its own nonprofit entity whose mission um, was to uh, work with alumni and support the university. And that model is actually pretty common with public universities, uh, partly because state laws restrict what universities can do. And if you have a separate foundation who does alumni relation development, there are things you can do that the university might not be able to do, like pay a football coach $7 million. Uh, so that's not an uncommon model for public universities. But more and more, it's extremely rare for private universities. Um, and those private universities that had that structure, uh, many of them have brought that organization into the university over the years. So we were in discussions, uh, and I've heard from folks that you know, some of these discussions go back 20 years, but we were in intense discussions over the last two years about bringing the GW Alumni Association uh, into the university. Uh, and eventually, uh, we weren't able um, to resolve it. And the university felt very strongly, and I feel very strongly, um, uh, about the need to move forward. And so um, we are going to build an alumni association within the university. Um, our trustees created a task force to oversee all forms of volunteer engagement here at the university, including what we do with the alumni association, what we do with some of our national councils. I know some folks are here, they're serving on some of those councils. So the board of trustees has been looking closely at how we best engage um, volunteers and alumni. And so that task force will help oversee how we create an alumni relations organization within the university. I can tell you we're committed to supporting our alumni, all 290,000 of them. Um, we're committed to alumni programming, both here on campus and in the regions. I've spent uh, a good chunk of my time in the last year getting out to San Francisco, LA, Boston, Miami, New York, et cetera, uh, to meet with alumni. Um, so we're committed to uh, strengthening our ties with alumni and, and moving forward under a different structure. Wonderful. All right, so let's go back to GW. Um, we received a following question from a student. What steps are you taking to ensure that GW is one day fossil free? So there's not a lot of debate about climate change is real. Um, there's a lot of noise. There's not a lot of debate. Um, and I have to say, when I think about what my generation has done to the next generation, this is one of the things that bothers me most. Um, so uh, climate change is real. Uh, I just came to GW from Miami. Sea level rise is going to be real and very soon. Um, I don't want to make breaking news, but if you own real estate in Miami, think very carefully about it. 
Uh, and much of the world is starting to be galvanized. Uh, I, I won't even just say starting. Much of the world is doing some real work about this. Right. Uh, and our university needs to lead in this effort as well. Uh, and we've done a lot of things. Um, we are now getting 50% of the energy um, that comes to GW is from renewable sources. Um, we had a plan that we articulated and announced um, at, by 2050 or 2040. Um, um, we would um, try to get all of our energy from there. We're ahead of schedule in, in that regard. Um, as an urban campus, I think that's especially important. Uh, the new buildings that we build are LEED certified buildings. Uh, we also are trying to lead with our education and research. Uh, we have a, a sustainability program that students can actually study. We have faculty doing research in this regard. Uh, and most recently, and again under leadership from the Student Association, um, your predecessors, and I'm sure supported by your administration as well, uh, we created a sustainable investment fund uh, and took some of the endowment dollars and, and set them aside in the sustainable investment fund, which I think will teach all of us, um, the faculty, the students, the, the trustees, and our community uh, about how we also do sustainable investing with our, with our resources. So I think we're on the path. We're ahead of schedule in some ways. Uh, we're also working with um, a consortium of universities in the district um, to deal with things like um, uh, wastewater, rainwater, et cetera, and uh, making uh, commitments in progress in those areas as well. So I think there's a lot of things that are happening in that regard. Right, and I think it's really encouraging to hear that that remains a priority for you. Um, I think students at UW care a lot about just climate change, about sustainability, and we look forward um, to continue partnership with you um, within a sustainable investment fund, but also with other um, projects as well. Well, if you look at the most recent United Nations fund, uh, report on right. climate change, which is very scary, um, all of the 40-year-olds that are going to have to deal with the 2040 deadline in the United Nations report are in college right now. If I were in college, boy, would I be anxious too. Um, so I completely understand the importance of this to our students, and I think it's incumbent on us to share that importance. Right. I've got two sons. I don't want to leave them a world in which they can't breathe, they can't drink clean water, um, all the challenges associated with it, and where the sea is rising and everybody has to live in Iowa. <laughs> I had nothing against Iowa, I met my wife there. Um, but if, if everybody's got a flow, uh, flow from the coast uh, inland because of sea level rise, it's gonna get very crowded. Right. So speaking about um, an issue that students care about, we also have another topic that I think a majority of students and also for the parents in the room um, would really appreciate is a uh, question about tuition and affordability. So can you talk a little bit about the efforts um, to make the university more affordable for our students? So I love talking to parents about this topic because I know how near and dear it is to their heart. Um, let me say, uh, first of all, the fastest growing expense item at universities is not gold-plated residence halls. Um, it's not administrative bloat. The fastest rising expense at most major universities is financial aid. And the reason is, is that most of those universities are committed to attracting the best students despite the fact they may come from families that can't afford to send them to college. Uh, and so we are trying to raise our financial aid budgets. Now we do that two ways. Um, one way is we aggressively try to raise philanthropic funds for that purpose. Uh, I have to say that I went to college on scholarship. If the prior generation didn't think it was worth investing in someone whose parents couldn't afford to send them to college, I wouldn't be here today. I have no idea where I'd be, but my guess is it wouldn't be as nice as being here with you. Um, and so one of the things we do uh, uh, through our uh, Power and Promise Fund is we try to raise money for scholarships. But it's also one of the things in our expense budget that tuition helps fund. Um, when I talk to students about why they want to come to GW or what they're looking for in a college, the diversity of the student body is one of the things I almost always get back. And when students say diversity, they mean people not like me, and they're not always pigeonholing it. It's not necessarily racial diversity or always racial diversity. It, it's not like me. Um, and socioeconomic diversity is an important part of that equation. Uh, here at GW, we have done something um, that I think is, is beneficial and something parents appreciate. And that is, once you enroll as a freshman and your tuition is X, it stays at X until you graduate. 
Um, so that flat tuition is something that maybe not all the parents are aware of when they first enroll, but they, they very quickly see in the second year their bill for tuition did not go up. So if you compare GW's tuition to most of our peers, you'll see a number that's very similar. The difference is over the four years, most of our peers are raising that number each year and we're not uh, over the four year period of time. Um, so that's something we've done uh, in terms of the affordability. Uh, we also do give a lot of financial aid. 70% of our students get some form of financial aid from the university. So when you talk about affordability, you have to look at not only the published tuition price, but also the actual financial aid package um, that a student gets. This is a subject that's very near and dear to my heart. As I say, both my wife and I went to college on scholarship. Um, so, so we get the importance of it. Uh, I did an event with student leaders. I think you were at the event just recently at the, the president's house. And I had three of our trustees who le formally lead the university speak. And all three of them went to GW on scholarship. And in one case, it was very clear this brilliant person, this talented person, this incredibly successful person would never have gotten where he is today without that scholarship from GW. And I see those stories over and over again. My mantra is the greatest force for social mobility in our society is education. And anything we can do to make that education available, we want to do it. Now, we have to be efficient with our resources. We're not raising tuition willy-nilly. Um, we've been raising tuition, um, again, it's fixed for your four years, but for the next class, it goes up at about uh, 3% a year. Um, and we've tried to be very efficient with the resources that we do get. Right. Yeah, and I think when you were speaking about the stories of those who came to GW on college, uh, on a scholarship, I think I'm also living out that story. Um, I myself, I am a first generation student like you. Um, I came from an immigration background. I came to the United States eight years ago um, and I was sworn in actually two years ago as a US citizen by a GW alum. So happy alumni weekend. Um, yeah, thank you. And I think that when I first came to GW, I, I see everyone different. Like I see everyone from a different background, racial, um, or just the way we think. Um, and I think that really plays into the next question that we have here is about diversity. Um, for me, as a person of color, as, a, as an immigrant, I realized that when I came here, I was empowered because of my differences. I was embraced for my differences. Uh, and because of that, I got to be the Student Association President, it's something that I have never thought about when I first immigrated to, uh, to the United States eight years ago when I couldn't even speak English. Um, yeah, and I think that that international students experience, that, that diversity experience is really important, and especially here at GW. Um, so I wanna ask, can you talk a little bit more about what we are doing, what the university is doing um, to create a more diverse university beyond just recruiting international students? So this is a really important subject because as I said, many students who come to GW tell me one of the things they're looking for is diversity. They may not know exactly what that means, but it's clear that's an important part of what they're looking for. And I think it's an important part of our educational process. Uh, I remember um, after my first trip to China, I came back and thought the, the story of the 21st century is what's going on in China. What are we doing as a university to make sure everybody really understands what's going on? Well, the obvious thing is, why don't we send some of our students to China? But the other thing is, is why don't we have more students with Chinese roommates? You want to learn about China? Move with a Chinese student. You'll learn a lot about China. So on campus, I think we've focused on diversity um, for a good while, and we're doing a, a pretty good job of creating a very diverse community. I think what I'm becoming more and more aware of, and our community is becoming more aware of, is we have to move from diversity to inclusion. Mm -hmm. And what's the difference? You know, diversity is kind of in the numbers. What fraction of your students represent this uh, slice of the population? What fraction represent that slice of the population? And through admissions and other things, you can sort of create a community that's very diverse. But what happens once they get here? Do they feel included? Whether it's international students or African American students or Hispanic students or Muslim students or transgender students, I mean, there are many different um, forms of diversity in our community. And once they're here, do they feel like they're in an inclusive community? And one of the things I learned in my first year is I learned in various ways in which some segment of our student body said, no, I don't feel particularly included, and here's why. Uh, and in many cases, boy, did they have a good point. 
I mean, it was almost like the, the students who stood up and said, we should be allowed to take 18 credit hours. Some of our students stood up and said, our policy should reflect this, and it doesn't. And I said, boy, they're right. We need to fix our policies. Or programming needs to reflect this, and they're right. It wasn't. So uh, once again, with, with students often taking the lead, uh, we created a diversity action plan with a lot of input from students. Um, and some of what comes with that action plan is additional training. You can't pluck a student out of the middle of whatever community they're in, put them in a completely new and different community and say, you're 18, figure it out. Um, we need to start to talk about that as a community. And so one of the things we've done is increase the diversity training uh, in the freshman orientation uh, as a part of that process as well. Um, so through our diversity action plan, there's a number of things we're doing um, that go even beyond training. And ultimately, I hope to get to a point where we have a community where people do feel it's inclusive. Now, one of the things you learn is you can create a wonderful, diverse, and inclusive community on campus, and the minute they walk off campus, they go, what happened? And that's something we have to help our students prepare for as well, because our society is not particularly uh, focused on inclusion. Uh, and I think that's something we have to work really hard on. Right, yeah, and I think working on that would help students like me to, even succeed, to have a successful college experience at GW. Um, I actually have another question for you before we go to questions from the audience, um, but at this time I would like to invite anyone who may have a question that you would like to ask President LeBlanc um, to line up in the middle aisle right here. And then in a moment, um, we will be calling on you. So last question for you um, from our online submission. We received several questions about health services, uh, including mental health services at GW. So can you discuss what the university is doing to make those services a lot more affordable and accessible for students? This is a really important issue, and I'm sure it's a special important issue for the parents. Um, one of the things that every university in the country is, is seeing is a dramatic increase um, in the need for health services and especially mental health services on college campuses. Um, we have students who come from their families and their communities, many of whom have had been on medications for some time and need to sustain that. Um, we have students for whom going off to college creates mental stresses and they need services for that. So this is a really important issue nationally, and that includes GW. Um, and so, again, the students have been great because they've come forward. I have to say, I don't use the student health service. I'm not a student. The students do. And they're really good about telling us, here's what's working, here's what's not working. Um, one of the things that we've um, looked at very carefully is, do all of our students have health insurance? Mm -hmm. And in an attempt, perhaps, to be somewhat liberal in its interpretation, we've created policies in which the answer isn't always yes. Um, students can stay on their parents' health insurance, but you have to make sure that it's going to cover services they need. Uh, but if they're not on their parents' health insurance, we make sure they have to be on our insurance because we want to make sure they can get the services that they need. So one of the things we've done is look at student health insurance. We've looked at service hours. A student can now get uh, access to mental health services 24-7. Students don't have a mental health crisis on an 8 to 5 schedule. Um, so we've got a, a, a call line that students can use. You can go to the uh, Colonial Health Center website and it'll show you the phone number for that. Um, and I think that's really important. So making sure students have the proper insurance, making sure we have the proper services, and make sure we have the proper access to those services. So we've been looking closely at that, and we've already made some, um, some very positive changes. But I do think it's a, it's a very critical issue. Right, and I agree wholeheartedly. Um, now I want to turn to audience questions. Um, we want to get through as many as possible within the next few minutes, so please keep your question brief. Um, before you begin, can you also state your name and affiliation to the university? Good morning. Um, my name is Thomas DeLima, and I'm a student in the Graduate School of Education and Human Development, and I'm also an Elliott School alum. Um, and my question is, while it's critical to, to build GW STEM programs to make us a more comprehensive institution, um, how do you plan to strengthen and support our humanities and social sciences? So thank you for that question. As the first scientist ever um, appointed president of George Washington University, I'm sensitive to the fact that every non-scientist is looking at me and going, what is he going to do to our university? Uh, I remember when I first became a dean of a college of arts and sciences, and all the humanities professors said, what is he going to do to us? Um, you know, scientists are people, too. Um, <laughs> and. <laughs> And I did not come to GW to distort or break 
its historic excellence in fields. Um, we are historically very strong in those fields that connect most immediately to being in DC. We have incredibly strong political science, we have strong international relations, we have strong law school. In those social science disciplines, um, we've historically been quite strong. As a university, and perhaps because the connection and leverage with DC is not quite as apparent, and the investment is significant, we haven't made comparable investments in science and engineering until fairly recently with the building of Science and Engineering Hall, which long predates me. So one of the things that made this institution attractive to me was the fact that GW had recognized the importance of STEM education and research and had made that investment. Um, so that, I think, is really important. The other thing the university did, which was of historic nature, is the university acquired the Corcoran School of the Arts. Um, and with it, it acquired the flag building over on 17th Street, which has incredible exhibition space and has an incredible history here in, in DC. So what I saw through those two actions and its historic excellence in the social sciences, which is, was a university that was expressing its commitment to comprehensive education from the arts and humanities, social sciences, policy, law, STEM disciplines, engineering, science, public health, and medicine. Uh, and I came to strengthen that entire university. So uh, I think I just mentioned earlier some of the work that we're, uh, I'm doing with the dean of the Elliott School to broaden and strengthen the Elliott School by creating access to other disciplines that the students didn't feel they had access to before. Uh, I'm working with the provost and the dean of arts and sciences and the director of Corcoran School to try to realize the preeminence opportunity that exists by bringing the historic flag building and the Corcoran School of the Arts into the university and partnering it with the performing arts that existed in the university to try to build serious strength uh, in the arts. So yes, we've got historic areas of strength that continue to be nurtured, need to be nurtured and strengthened. We've got emerging areas of strength in the arts and in the STEM disciplines, and it's bringing those disciplines up together that I, that I see as my job. President LeBlanc, thank you so much for holding this public forum. My name is um, Xavier Adamatis, and I'm in the Elliott School. I actually just asked Dean B this question earlier about the, the waitlist numbers for courses going into the triple digits, the le fewer and fewer course offerings every year, and what the university really plans to do about that, because they're spending hundreds of million dollars on this development of Rice Hall, and the students aren't seeing a change and increase in the staff that they have and the courses they have access to. So let me just make a factual statement that we're not spending money on Rice Hall. We did a land, by the way, Rice Hall is where the president's office is. So when people say Rice Hall, what they really mean is the administration. Um, we're not spending money on Rice Hall. We're making money by um, leasing the land under Rice Hall and the surrounding building to a, a developer who will develop um, some interesting retail and other options there, and those the revenues from that will will strengthen our academic programs and flow into the university. So it's it's the opposite. We're not spending; we're we're actually making money. Um, I was announced as president in January 2017, and in February 2017, they told me that they were tearing down my office, um, <laughs> and I'd have to move. Um, but your your point is a is an excellent point, and, and one I'm concerned about, and that is any artificial barrier that students face in access to their academic goals. And a barrier exists if you can't take a course you want to take. Um, so one of the things I'm looking at and I'm talking to the deans about are questions about access to courses. There are a number of barriers that, create, uh, that, that can be artificially created that prevent students from achieving their goals. For example, um, at many universities, including GW, far too many of our courses are offered between 11 and 2 p.m. So if you want to do three different things and they're all scheduled at the same time, you can do them. Uh, now, why are they all between 11 and, and, and 2 p.m.? Because if you ask the students, what are the most convenient hours for your classes? They'll say something like 11 to 2 p.m., Tuesday and Wednesday. <laughs> because, I mean, to be fair, because I have an internship that takes me off campus on Monday, uh, Thursday, Friday, because I have to work a job to stay in school. I'm not, I'm not saying these are frivolous reasons, but they want to compact their educational part because of the other things they're doing. 
Well, the faculty are in the same boat. If you ask the faculty, when do you want to teach? They'll say, well, I travel to conferences, give papers, do research, et cetera. So I'd like to teach on Tuesday. Um, and 11 to 2 would be fine. Uh, and again, I'm not criticizing it. It's natural human nature that we end up there. But the consequence of rational behavior on the part of students and faculty is that they can't get into the courses they want to get into. As a result, they can't always pursue a second major if they wanted to. I mean, there's a number of things students should be allowed to do that it makes it difficult for them to do. Now, it is the, also the case that we have changes in student interest. For example, this year, I think in Elliott School, you mentioned you're from the Elliott School, I think we have the largest incoming class in the Elliott School we've ever had. Um, and it's difficult sometimes to spin on a dime and make sure everything is available to them that would have been available when there's a smaller class. My commitment is to say, we're going to look at those problems, and we're going to try and see what we can do to solve them. Uh, speaking to the parents, I would say, I think it's a good idea for every freshman to take an 8 or 9 o'clock class. It gets them up. And this is before they figured out they can skip class. So <laughs> there, there ought to be freshman courses that are possible and, 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 and necessary that now people are saying, you're crazy. I took Calculus 3 at 8 o'clock in the morning. It was the most boring course I took in college. It was 8 o'clock in the morning. But I had to have Calculus 3 to be a computer scientist, so I took it. Um, so we do need to look at scheduling. We do need to look at course availability. We should look at class sizes. I've heard of a class that students die to take, and it's capped at 20. Now, if I get a class of 20 that they die to take, would they be really happy to take at 40? Maybe. And we ought to be starting to have those kinds of conversations as well. But Access to courses is one of the, the real issues that I need, to, I need to work with the deans on and make sure they're available. So I appreciate the question. Good morning, President LeBlanc. Good morning. Ashley. My name is Harlan McMurray, and I'm a staff member serving proudly in the Office of Alumni Relations. And President LeBlanc, you've been out on the road recently meeting with uh, alumni, families, and friends. And my question is, what are you hearing back from the alumni and parents that you're meeting with? So I call my trips out of town a B12 shot because they tend to be high energy in the following sense. When you're on campus, you're spending all day hearing about the problems and trying to fix the problems. When you go out and visit alumni and parents, they have a perspective from 500 miles away or 1,000 miles away or whatever it is, and it reminds you of the strengths. Um, I love hearing from parents. Sometimes there's criticisms. But the overarching theme is often, my child's having a great experience at GW. Yeah, Thurston's not great. Uh, I'm a little concerned they're not eating as much as I'd like. Um, you know, those kinds of issues. But overall, I can't believe the experience they're having. My son, one, one woman said to me, her freshman daughter, her first week at GW, she met Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And mom fell out of her chair when her daughter called her and said, this is week one. And all I can picture is, what else is that young woman going to do in the next four years? Um, I have heard from a family who talked about their son walking on campus and, and stopping to meet President Macron. Where else does that happen? So I hear these wonderful stories that remind me of the value of the place we're building. We're almost 200 years old. We have millions of stories about being almost 200 years old and all the th impacts that we've had on people. I mentioned the event we had at the house with our three trustees. These are people of real substance who've gone on to really prominent positions who tell me if it wasn't for somebody in GW seeing value in me as an 18-year-old and making it possible for me to come here, my life is different and probably much worse. Um, so hearing those stories, I get to build a whole portfolio that reminds me continually of what we're doing, why we're doing it, what's important. And I bring that portfolio back to campus, and I share it with faculty. The most common question I get from an alumnus on the road is, is Professor so-and-so still there? <laughs> that professor changed my life. Now, sometimes I, meet, I, may, I actually met an 80-year-old gentleman who said, is Professor so-and-so still there? <laughs> And I'm thinking to myself, there's a chance, but probably small. <laughs> um, but the fact that this 80-year-old gentleman that many years later said, transformative in my life was the role of that professor. And I come back and I tell the professors that because I want to remind them they are having huge impact 
on their students, even if they don't always quite recognize it. Hi, thank you. Uh, Håkan Molin is my name. My wife is Japanese and I'm Swedish. And we came to this country because we thought it was very loving and warm and open and inclusive, and it still is. But my question is, we're sending our daughter here, she's a freshman. There seems to be more hate than love in some parts of this country right now. So my question to you, uh, how do you address civil discourse to teach students how to debate without hate? Uh, that's really my question. What a great question. I referred earlier to uh, GW is located in the most consequential 64 square miles in the world, which creates a great opportunity. And it's an opportunity for us to be a role model for exactly the point you're making, which is civil discourse. Um, we have policies that say we invite debate and we invite free expression, but we're a community. Um, and so we're not inviting hate directed at individuals. We're not inviting hate directed at personal characteristics. To the contrary, we're saying, come and have free speech, civil discourse, but these are the lines. Um, and I think being three blocks in the White House, a little farther walk to Capitol, Supreme Court, the State Department, we are and are becoming even more so a forum for civil discourse. We have speakers on campus from all parts of our government and from all parts of our society. They're welcome to come and speak on campus, and alternative views are welcome to come and speak on campus, and we want to be a role model for exactly the civic discourse that you're describing. And when I say role model, it's one thing to be, in theory, a role model. It's another thing to be a role model by having the actual people in government come and watch us do this. Uh, my first month on the job, we had a thousand intelligence agents from around the world and the head of the CIA on campus. Now, I'd never been in DC at GW before, and I wondered, what's the reaction to having a thousand intelligence agents on campus? Our students were thrilled because a lot of them might want to be in the intelligence business or in the security business. Two days later, we had the Secretary of Education on campus. The Secretary of Education, in some quarters, is, is controversial, particularly around some proposed changes to how we deal with Title IX. We had 30 protesters for the Secretary of Education. But they were civil. They were appropriate. They made their point. She came. She spoke. I thought it was a great model of, of, of civil discourse, and it's something that um, the university is committed to. I will say that we have one advantage. We had, uh, uh, before I got here, uh, we had a very um, provocative speaker, Milo, come to campus, uh, and there had been disruptions at a number of universities where he spoke. Uh, when he came to GW, he was allowed to speak, absolutely. But we also said only members of the GW community can go in. We don't have to make a public forum for others who have a different agenda to come on campus and, and create their agenda. Uh, we hosted the event. It, it went off without incident. He was allowed to speak. People with different views were allowed to speak. That's what I mean about being a role model for this. So I share your concern about the coarsening uh, of discourse and, and society. Higher ed needs to be a place that can role model for the rest of society what's possible and the benefits of what's possible. And I hope that because of our location, we become leaders in that, in that very effort. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. President. My name is Ari LeMay. Um, thank you very much for providing this forum for us. There is no doubt as parents that, that we understand GW to be a place where we can entrust the education of our son. We have no doubt that GW offers a world-class education, um, but rankings do matter. And so my question to you is, as parents, as students, what can we do to, to help the rankings for George Washington while the students are here, while we are a part of the community? Thank you. Well, thank you for that question, because I spent my whole life in higher ed, and I've become a student of rankings. 
and I know the ways in which they matter and the ways in which they don't. And I also know that they're changing and evolving over time. Um, so let me give you an example of the way in which they matter, in my view, and the way in which they don't. So the way in which they matter. The US news ranking is one that a lot of people read. A lot of, a lot of publicity around that one. And the US news ranking introduced a variable called the six-year graduation rate. Now, the six-year graduation rate does not mean we hope you'll all pay tuition for six years. That's not what it means. The federal government tried to figure out how are we going to measure graduation rates at colleges. And so the natural reaction is, how many students graduate after four years? And a bunch of colleges says, well, that's not really fair because Timmy was only three credits shy. He did it over the, over the summer. You shouldn't count him as a dropout. And so the federal government said, OK, we'll include Timmy and everybody who only needed a few credits over the summer. And then we said, well, Susan had mono in her freshman year. And so she had to take a leave, and it took her four and a half years. So you shouldn't count against Susan. He said, oh, OK, we'll count Susan. And by the time all of this rolled out, they said, look, if you're ever going to graduate from college, 99.99% probability you did it within six years. And that was the genesis of the six-year graduation rate. So at the end of six years, the question is asked, what fraction of the freshman class that came in six years ago now has their degree? That's the standard metric. And US News introduced it as a variable. And over time, they have dramatically increased the value of that variable. What US News is effectively telling universities is we're watching to see if you're actually graduating students. Do you know what you call a young person who's three credits shy of graduation? A high school graduate. They go out into an economy that is viciously focused on training and education. And they're three credits shy of having the certificate that says they're a college graduate. I don't want a single student to ever leave here three credits shy, or six credits shy, or 12 credits shy. US News, uh, I think, focused on that variable. And that's one good thing they did. But let me tell you two really bad things US News did. First of all, they overly focused attention on the SAT. Everybody in higher education knows the best predictor of performance in college is your high school performance, not the SAT. But we created an obsessed industry that parents buy SAT training, and people sell SAT training. And what's your SAT of your kid? Oh, I'm so sorry, Johnny's not a 1400. It's ridiculous. That's a bad thing they did. Let me tell you another bad thing they did through omission. US News completely ignored the diversity of the student body. No variable that measures it. Now, we could argue that diversity is a good thing. Therefore, they should have such a variable. But whether you're agnostic on diversity or you hugely support it, by having no variable, they then punish you with other variables that are endemic to a diverse student body. And that, I think, was really uh, wrong. So I know that people read US News. I don't think they have a clue what it means. I will never forget the year that I, I think it was Penn State and Yeshiva tied in the US News ranking. And I'm imagining a family sitting down with their child at the dinner table going, Johnny can't decide between a public university with 60,000 students in rural Western Pennsylvania or a Jewish uh, training school in Manhattan. He's stuck on that. Let's go to the US News rankings to help us get the information we need to make that decision. And they opened it up and go, they're tied. Now we have no idea how to make a decision. What on earth is going on? So that's, I think, the bad side of rankings. Having said that, I see the value to a university when you're doing well in the rankings to talk about that and people feel pride. We actually went up in one ranking system and went down in the other ranking system. And we went up for what I thought were good reasons. And we went down for bad reasons. But nobody else is studying the way I am. And they look at that and go, I don't know what to do with this. I think the rankings are going to have less and less an impact because more and more ranking systems are being developed. They're being more comprehensive. They're competing for eyeballs with the US News ranking. I mean, just, just show of hands. How many people's children went to high school with a class rank, a formal class rank, and you know your child's class rank? A couple. Class rank is still a variable in US News. The high schools won't rank the classes anymore, and it's still a variable in the US News. It's ridiculous. So I'm not a big fan of the actual changes that the ranking systems are imposing on, on higher ed. 
And I think higher ed is starting to fight back. Let me answer your question a different way. How can you help? You can be brand ambassadors for GW. You know us better than anyone else. Go back to your communities and talk about the positive things about GW, whether they're counted in a ranking system or not. My child met Ruth Bader Ginsburg in week one, and that's just a start of an enormously unique education that I couldn't have gotten anywhere else. My child went to the Macron State visit, and that's an experience he couldn't have gotten anywhere else. My child is doing an internship at the Supreme Court this fall. Couldn't have happened anywhere else. Be brand ambassadors because you know us, you know the quality of what's going on here. And I think over time, that will have a positive impact on our overall reputation. Hi. <clears throat> my daughter won't let me get my name. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I, I, Maybe I not, but can you tell us her name? No. <laughs> That's a good one, but I pay tuition in housing. So uh, my question is really freshman residence life. Yes. Uh, my, my daughter lives in Thurston Hall. I'm not sure that uh, they're allowed to stick six 18-year-old girls in 600 square feet at Guantanamo Bay. So <laughs> what are you going to – does it make sense to put all the freshmen in one dorm? I mean, what – what are you, and if it does, what are you going to do about, right. what are you going to do about improving that freshman experience in a dorm? Thank you for that question. That's a really important question. Um, by the way, if your son or daughter is not in Thurston, you may not have the complete context um, for this gentleman's question. <laughs> um, Thurston is a residence hall where primarily, uh, other than RAs, is primarily freshmen. Um, it's across the street from my house. Um, so I really can keep an eye on it. And it houses, at the moment, about 1,071 students, the vast majority of which are freshmen, in a nine-floor uh, building. That is incredibly dense. In my view, way too dense. Um, so to the first point, should I have six 18-year-old women or 18-year-old men um, living in 600 square feet? Uh, my ideal? Absolutely not. So one of the first things I committed to doing is a major overhaul of Thurston Hall. Um, the Board of Trustees has already allocated the money for us to do it. Um, we have to work through uh, certain zoning issues with the district, et cetera. But uh, we are on a, a fast track path to completely renovate Thurston. And when I say completely renovate, what I've told the people is our principle ought to be um, a experience in which parents and students alike come away saying this is a first class uh, freshman residence hall in an urban environment. Um, because in an urban environment you often have limits and I want people to come away saying wow that was a first class experience. We're not there today. Um, Thurston is too dense. It hasn't been renovated uh, in, in a long time. There are basic infrastructure issues that, that would be addressed under renovation. And when I say renovation I don't mean paint and plaster. I mean strip it down to the studs. Uh, and do a rebuild. Now you might say if you're going to strip it down to the studs, why not tear it down? It turns out Thurston Hall is in an historic district. Uh, Foggy Bottom is an historic district. And Thurston is a contributing uh, factor to the historic district, which means you can do a lot to it, but you can't actually tear it down. So we will do a complete rebuild inside um, the, the shell of Thurston. At the same time, we're also fast-tracking a plan to build a new residence hall and that's how we will affect the decompression of Thurston. So we will take out of Thurston probably 300, 350 students, something like that, will come out of Thurston uh, post-renovation. Um, and I hope to have both of those projects done. If I state something out loud, I know my folks will shoot me, because it depends on working with um, um, the district, getting some zoning relief, et cetera. Uh, but I will say it's one of my highest priorities and something uh, we've already got the money for, so I'm optimistic um, we'll see it. Uh, in the not too distant future. The second part of your question is, does it make sense to house freshmen together? Uh, and the answer is yes, if. So let me give you the uh, wh why one might say yes. Because freshmen are all going through the same experience. And there's nothing like a shared experience to create community. Um, they have need for many of the same things. They need a, a form of academic advising that might be pre-major advising 
that upper class students may not need. Um, they may need, need help adjusting to college life. They may need help learning about DC. So if you target programming in a freshman residence halls, there are a lot of positives that come, come from having freshmen live together. If you don't, then all you have is a collection of 1,000 people who don't know what they're doing. Um, <laughs> so you really do need that. Um, and, and that's something we're very much focused on. We have recently hired uh, a new individual, uh, Sissy Petty. Is Sissy here by any chance? Yeah, here. Would you please stand? Oh. <laughs> Sissy Petty. <laughs> Sissy Petty is an incredibly experienced student life professional who we've hired as the dean for the student experience. Think about that, the dean for the student experience. Every parent, Please take advantage of this opportunity. Come introduce yourself to Sissy, because every aspect of the student experience will now come through Sissy. And so now I have one person to turn to and say, Sissy, how are we doing on this? One of the things we've talked about is completely revising the freshman experience. Even if we have the proper residence hall, we have to have the proper programming. So one of the things that we've talked about and I'm very excited about is rather than plop 18-year-olds down in a residence hall and say, by the way, you're in DC. It's pretty exciting. Figure it out. I would like to do all sorts of programming in the first year on a cohort basis. Take a floor and take them to the Smithsonian. If you take them once, they'll go a second time. They might not go the first time if you don't take them. Take them to the Air and Space Museum. Take them to the African American History Museum. Take them to these various places. We have a faculty member who takes his course to the Library of Congress to show them how to use a certain resource used in the course and has them all get Library of Congress library cards. I guarantee you they go back after that. So if our freshman experience is using cohorts built out of residence halls to introduce them to DC, to create advising programs, to create uh, support programs in the residence hall, I think we can have a very effective freshman year program and that's what we're working on. Don't want to tell me your daughter's name yet, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but is she having a good experience? <laughs> so we actually have time for one more question. So you will be the last question for the day. Congratulations. Uh, Thank you. So yeah, uh, please go ahead. And my name is Adele, um, and I have a freshman who isn't Thurston, who is actually really loving it. Um, so um, I want to tell just a quick story. I, my first year here, I watch all these students come by my house heading over to Thurston because they all live there. And then I'm walking up the street a little bit, and I'm watching another group of students going towards Thurston. I said, where do you guys live? So we live in Potomac. I said, where are you going? He said, Thurston. I said, why? He said, all of our friends are there. Um, there is something about Thurston that generations of students have found very attractive. But I want to fix the other stuff. OK. okay um... So I, I, I have a question focusing on academics. Um, I just wanted to say that my daughter is one of those students that couldn't get, I think she didn't get, she wasn't able to get three of the freshman required classes this semester, uh, just to throw that out there. But my question is, um, um, I want you to talk a little bit about the academics and what's being done to strengthen that for the students. Um, I guess I come from a liberal arts background, and and I think it's incredibly important for um, for the students to be taught how to how to be a learner for the rest of their life, um, how to read, write, and critic and 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 critically think. Because I think whether they go on to grad school or not, they're going to need that for their jobs and their life. Um, and I just I, I want to hear a little bit about. Um, what's happening to to support the teachers and and you know the academic programs and to make them stronger for our kids because in the end um, that's what my daughter is here for. Right. Thank you. So thank you for the question. Um, there are a couple of different ways to approach the academic offerings. Um, one way uh, that's very historic is kind of the traditional core curriculum, in which the faculty sit down and say, here's what every student should know. And so every student has to take this. And then beyond that, they can do a major. Um, and the Jesuit institutions have been famous for this for, for many, many years. Um, and other schools have even picked up on the idea and created their core curriculum. Um, there's another model, which is kind of exemplified by Brown, which is here's, here's our buffet of offerings. 
Um, we're not really going to tell you what to take. Uh, and then there are a lot of universities that are kind of in the middle. And I would say GW is an example of a university that's kind of in the middle. Because we have a diversity of academic offerings, we have 20% of our students are in the Elliott School. 20% um, of our students are in business school. Uh, 10 to 15% of our students are in engineering. Uh, and, then the, and then the bulk of the rest um, are in arts and sciences. But within arts and sciences, you have students that are taking accredited kind of almost professional degrees in some of the science disciplines, and then taking the classic liberal arts and the humanities disciplines. So I've always been a big believer on access and choice. Uh, I, as a person growing up, I hated requirements. Tell me I had to do something, I'd spend all my time trying to figure out how not to do it. Um, and I think today, our students know what they want to do for the most part. And it's explore and it's follow specific interests that they have. And we need to make sure that they can do that. So I can't guarantee you every student that comes to GW will take modern American history and is properly educated as, as, a, as a student who votes in the future. But I can guarantee you that we're creating a structure in which they learn to write, they learn to critically think, and they will apply those skills in these different disciplines. The strongest thing that we can do to make sure that we're good at all of that is hire strong faculty. And I'm really committed to doing that. And we have some great examples of faculty who are not only great in the classroom, but are making a difference in the world through their scholarship, their research, their policies, et cetera. Um, I think one of the most fabulous examples we had recently is our School of Public Health did the study on the death toll from the hurricane in Puerto Rico. Uh, and that was probably covered by more media than any academic story I'd seen in the last 10 years. And the President of the United States did a few tweets, and the media covered it all over again a few days later. Um, so it was really a phenomenal example. And we have undergraduates who are studying public health. So they've got faculty who are making a difference on a day-to-day -day basis who are teaching them in the classroom. And continuing to grow and strengthen our faculty is a critical part uh, of the answer to the question, what are we doing to strengthen the academics? Because not only do the faculty provide the individual courses, but the faculty collectively define the requirements, the expectations, um, they grant the degrees, and everything that leads to the, the academic progress of our students. So I'm committed to continuing to uh, grow the strength of our faculty across a broad range of disciplines, to work with the faculty to remove artificial barriers. Uh, I always stress artificial. If you want to be a doctor, you have to pass organic chemistry. I'm not making you take organic chemistry. The field of medicine is making you take organic chemistry. So don't tell me I want to be a doctor, but no organic chemistry, and I can't stand blood. <laughs> I'm sorry, then you don't really want to be a doctor. But I would say take away artificial barriers. And the artificial barriers can include we scheduled the classes so you can't actually take them, or we created requirements that you don't really need to satisfy uh, your goals, but we've decided to impose them on you anyway. If I can get great faculty, remove artificial barriers, and give good advice to students so they're making reasonable choices to pursue their goals, then I think we'll be able to achieve the goals that you've just described. All right, and I think that concludes our program today. Um, yes. Thank you. Before we end, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you for the questions that you have been asking, uh, both, both online and in person. Thank you um, to the staff, uh, alumni, parents, and even the students who may or may not want to give us their names. Um, and, and we and hope- A special thank you to Ashley, our moderator. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> My honor. Yeah. We hope you have an, uh, an, an incredible weekend, the rest of your time here at GW. Um, we hope that you have an umbrella or a rain jacket, <laughs> but it's a nice day no matter what. So thank you, and we'll see you for, um, in the next couple of events at, for the next two days. Thanks.